Thanks for joining us for CBN News Watch. I'm Mark Martin. Today, preparing for military action, the United States and Israel holding discussions about the possibility of a strike on Iran if necessary over its nuclear program. President Biden calling on international leaders to take a stand in support of democracy as it faces growing threats around the world. Plus, it's a controversial treatment for COVID that can be effective, but some doctors won't use it even for critically ill patients. The doctor that I talked to told me that ivermectin was dangerous and that they would not administer it. It was not, it was not approved by the FDA. For COVID. We'll tell you about the medical and legal battles around ivermectin. She was press secretary for President Trump and at the same time the mother of a five-month-old. How her faith in God carried her through difficult times. I was one piece in what is a much bigger puzzle um, and that's God's plan for all of us. Why she says prayer was indispensable. And Christmas observances seem to be starting earlier and earlier as the years go by. And for many people, that's just more time to celebrate the reason for the season. Those stories and more today on CBN Newswatch. This is CBN Newswatch. We begin with discussions between Israel and the United States to discuss how to deal with a threat from Iran, including possible military action. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin met with Israeli Defense Minister Benny Gantz at the Pentagon Thursday. Gantz talked about the threat from Iran's ongoing nuclear program, and Austin said he was deeply concerned about Iran's nuclear actions in recent months and its failure to work on diplomatic solutions. The president has made clear that if diplomacy fails, we are prepared to turn to other options. The nuclear program is a means to Iran's hegemonic goals, imposing its radical ideology and threatening Israel's existence. As the Iranian nuclear talks have stalled, Gantz warned it's time to prepare for military options in case diplomacy fails. Fights on. That's the signal that Israel's most advanced aerial exercise is about to take off. Blue Flags 2021 is a multinational effort featuring top fighter jets from seven different countries. So what's the purpose of this show of unity and strength? One goal is to send a clear message to enemies in the Middle East. Chris Mitchell reports from Israel's Negev Desert. That's the sound of some of the world's most advanced fighter jets filling the skies over Israel. The Blue Flag 2021 exercise here in the Uvda base in the heart of the Negev Desert is Israel's largest, most advanced exercise. And as it says, they bring together side by side, wing to wing, the best air forces in the world. This allied force includes the U.S., Greece, Germany, India, France, Italy, and for the first time, the U.K. This is a great opportunity for Israel, again, to show how we do cooperation and why we do it. Seven different countries come to Israel, to this beautiful land, to train together and see how we can do things better. The challenge is merging different countries, aircraft, and tactics into one cohesive unit to fight a common enemy. This unidentified Israeli pilot flies the F-35. I mean, it's such different. Their air force are different than ours, and it's so nice to see how it, Things are going in different places and different experiences and different feelings. But we learn a lot from that, both in the professional side and in the personal side. It's a fantastic experience, uh, learning uh, the different tactics and philosophies of how they like to operate the mission. And from there, especially me as a younger wingman, learning just see different other perspectives and experiences within the fighter community. In addition to personnel, a main goal is incorporating aircraft, such as bringing the latest F-35 Joint Strike Fighter alongside older F-15 and F-16s. Then, as the pilots take off over the Negev Desert, their motto becomes Fights On. Fights On is just a brevity term used to tell everyone, hey, we're about to start uh, tactically maneuvering, so prepare. Germany has joined the biannual exercise several times. That's key given the troubled history between the two countries. Over the last years, we've uh, developed really close relationships. Uh, it's the third time that we're participating in Blue Flag. Also last year, we had an Israeli squadron at our base uh, for a change. So for us, coming here now is uh, really a very special event. Uh, it's so special that we even uh, painted one of our typhoons uh, with special colors representing the German and the Israeli flag. 
While the camaraderie is important, Israeli officials are constantly reminded that they operate in the world's most dangerous airspace. A senior IDF official tells CBN News, over the past few years, Israeli warplanes have been fired upon more than a thousand times while attempting to stop the spread of Iranian influence on Israel's borders. This gathering also saw an historic development with the attendance of a special guest. The visit of the Air Force commander from the United Arab Emirates represents a quantum leap in cooperation between former Middle East enemies. It's a very significant visit. The Abraham Agreement opened a variety of, uh, let's say, opportunities in the region to collaboration and cooperation between uh, countries that we didn't flew with them for the last 75 years. It's a signal of stability and also a force uh, demonstration. That sends a clear message of deterrence to Iran and other enemies in the region. So we believe that the cooperation of different countries, both in the region and globally, that share the same interests and the same values can really promote the stability of the region. And by showing that we are here cooperating and are oriented to that goal, we believe can bring more stability to the region. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Uvda Air Force Base, the Negev Desert. Here at home, President Biden will wrap up his two-day virtual summit today, calling on world leaders to reverse what he calls a backward slide of democracy. Heather Sells has that story. The president maintains democracy at home and abroad is in trouble and pointed to data showing a disturbing move in the wrong direction. In my view, this is the defining challenge of our time. The president said a Freedom House report shows 15 consecutive years of worldwide decline. Biden called for countries to stand firm for the key freedoms of speech, assembly and religion, plus human rights. And he admitted the U.S. must do the same. Here in the United States, we know as well as anyone that renewing our democracy and strengthening our democratic institutions requires constant effort. The virtual gathering of more than 100 leaders was billed the first summit for democracy. Those not on the list, notably Russia and China, accuse the administration of a Cold War mentality that will stoke ideological confrontation. And critics questioned why others were not invited. Noticeably absent from this forum are dissidents uh, from Hong Kong, dissidents from Russia, dissidents uh, from China, Cuba, uh, Venezuela, if you want to, and Iran. Wilkie, the former veteran affairs chief under President Trump, criticized Biden for failing to take on top dictators. You want to make an impact on the world and say that, yes, we are here to promote the natural rights of, of all human beings. You have to take a step forward and actually challenge the regimes that are a threat to the world. The summit comes as the U.S. presses Iran to de-escalate its nuclear buildup. If diplomacy cannot get on track soon, and if Iran's nuclear program continues to accelerate, then we will have no choice but to take additional measures. Equally urgent, the Russian military buildup on the border with Ukraine. The White House is warning Russian President Putin of, quote, severe consequences if Russia invades Ukraine. It's an immediate test of how far the Biden administration will go to protect democracy abroad. Heather Sell, CBN News. Here's a quick look now at other stories in the news. Jesse Smollett has been convicted for lying to police about a racist, homophobic attack. Smollett was widely supported by many liberals when he first told his story nearly three years ago, but his report did not withstand scrutiny. California says it will be a sanctuary state for abortions if the Supreme Court overturns Roe v. Wade, possibly even paying for people to travel to the state to get them. And non-citizens in New York City would gain the right to vote in local elections under a measure approved by the city council. Coming up, it's a controversial treatment for COVID, the drug ivermectin. Major doctors groups are, are against using it, but many physicians do anyway. We'll look at some of the conflicts they run into when we come back.
Though major physicians associations oppose its use, a number of doctors believe the drug ivermectin is a good treatment for COVID, prescribing the controversial drug in their own offices. But doctors who work in hospitals must abide by their policies. And as Lori Johnson reports, that's causing friction among some hospitals, doctors, and patients. An ICU doctor sued Sentara Norfolk General Hospital to allow him to prescribe ivermectin to his COVID-19 patients. The hospital banned the practice after the FDA and CDC warned against it. On its website, the FDA explains on this page that it approved ivermectin to treat worms, head lice, and skin conditions like rosacea. But data do not show ivermectin is effective against COVID-19, adding that clinical trials are ongoing. Norfolk physician Paul Merrick, however, maintains his COVID treatment using ivermectin and other substances saves lives. CBN News first interviewed Merrick in 2017 about his groundbreaking treatment for sepsis, although he declined to talk about his ivermectin treatment on advice from his attorneys. The treatment, entitled Math Plus, is described on the Frontline COVID-19 Critical Care Alliance website website, an organization Merrick co-founded. Also on the website, ivermectin research from other countries showing its effectiveness in treating COVID-19. Dr. Merrick asked a judge to force Sentara Norfolk General to let him provide ivermectin to his COVID patients. He died a month after he turned 60 in the hospital. Outside the courthouse, Merrick's supporters protested the hospital's ivermectin ban including a woman who says her husband died when a different hospital refused to allow Merrick's treatment. I begged every single doctor that came in contact with my husband for 36 days. And we were denied every time. Another woman said her critically ill husband was denied ivermectin at hospitals in Lynchburg and Charlottesville, Virginia. The doctor that I talked to told me that ivermectin was dangerous and that they would not administer it. It was not, it was not approved by the FDA for COVID. Some doctors who prescribe ivermectin in their offices believe hospital physicians should be given the same right. Our patients should never be in denied treatment by a hospital administration or the government. It is only in COVID that this has changed and that the hands of physicians have been tied around this country and we've been prevented from giving treatments that we believe would help a patient. Sentara Healthcare responded to Dr. Merrick's lawsuit by saying, in most situations, physicians are able to deviate from guidelines to individualize care for patients. However, in some scenarios, treatments that may potentially harm patients or that are widely considered to be outside the standard of care may be limited. A judge denied Dr. Merrick's request to immediately begin prescribing ivermectin to his patients. The case may go to trial next year. Meanwhile, other cases like it have been resolved with mixed results. The American Bar Association reports in three cases, hospitals were forced to allow ivermectin treatment, and in four others, bans on the drug were upheld. Lori Johnson, CBN News. Still ahead, she served as press secretary to President Trump while she was also the mother of a five-month-old. Kaylee McEnany looks back on her White House days and how millions of Christians helped her get through it in an interview with CBN News right after this. She held a pacifier to her baby's lips while handling a call from the president. Kaylee McEnany was the mother of a five-month-old when she took the job as press secretary in the Trump White House. What was one of her hardest days of her tenure, and how did millions of Christians help her get through it? Kaylee reveals those answers and much more in her new book, and recently she talked with Abigail Robertson about being called to her role for such a time as this. For almost a year, Kaylee McEnany had a front row seat to some of the most high stakes moments in our country's history. And for such a time as this, my faith journey through the White House and beyond, she takes readers along for the ride and describes how her faith in God carried her through. 
I was one piece in what is a much bigger puzzle, um, and that's God's plan for all of us. McEnany says relying on God was key to her success at the White House. One of the things I did before the first time I took to the podium was talk to one of my predecessors, Sarah Sanders, and she sent me a list of advice, and one of them was, most importantly, pray. Prayer played an important role ahead of her first briefing on May 1st, 2020. So good afternoon. I have an announcement. I'm supposed to take to the podium at 2 p.m., but rather than walking to the podium, I'm in my office crying out of you know such nerves. You know, Sarah had told me, you know, most importantly, don't worry and pray, but I was indeed worrying. So she turned to her faith. And I went to the West Wing bathroom, the private bathroom there, and got on my knees and prayed. Uh, and Vice President Mike Pence went like this to me and said, I've been praying for you, which meant a whole lot. And I can tell you it was Christians like Sarah and the Vice President and Christians across the country who prayed for the administration that I think um, helped. I, I know that it helped the Trump administration along the way, and it certainly helped me, millions of Christians praying. Praying with their team ahead of briefings soon became the norm. You really were there at a historic time in our country. A lot happened. What was one of the hardest days that you went through? I think one of the hardest days for me it was certainly when the president of the United States got COVID-19. It was the most fearful I've been. It was extremely eerie to be in a White House in a West Wing without a commander in chief in the Oval Office. Despite a resume that qualified her for the job, McEnany credits the Lord for leading her there. I was brought to this position for such a time as this by Christ. I didn't make it there my own. And I want anyone reading this to know you are where you are in a place, in a time, in a circumstance, in your body for such a time as this for a reason and a purpose. And if you ask Christ, to guide you, um, he will take you to uh, show you that plan he has for, for your life, just like he did for me. McEnany's daughter, Blake, was just five months old when she started at the White House. I learned how to hold a pacifier in my daughter's lips while fielding a call from the president and answering reporters in between in a rotating series of calls. McEnany also shares how Trump reacted to constant negative media reports and the story that upset him most. I can say without a doubt it's the Atlantic story. The president was in the middle of doing a rally and the story comes out that says President Trump had called fallen military men and women suckers and losers. It was just categorically false. Since leaving office, other former administration officials have written books sharing unflattering depictions of life inside the Trump White House. It's very frustrating because it doesn't ring true to the person that I knew. Was he a tough boss? Certainly. He's the president of the United States. He's a businessman. You know, we know who President Trump is. So he, he demands, you know, the, the highest level of hard work from those around him. But he also is a father, a great family man, and someone who um, I grew to know and love. If President Trump runs again in 2024, will you be a part of the campaign. I never say never to anything, but I'd say it'd, it'd be hard to go back on the campaign trail. I hope to have more children by then. We'll see. Um, but it would be hard to be a mom of many to be on the campaign trail. But I, you know, I say the greatest honor, professionally speaking, of my life was getting the call to be press secretary and being asked to serve um, in public service at, at a high level in government is an honor. So, um, you know, who knows if, if I was ever asked to do that again, it, it certainly was the, the high honor of a lifetime for sure. McEnany says she doesn't know if former President Donald Trump will run again in 2024. Regardless, she believes the GOP is stronger and more united than ever before. Reporting from Virginia, Abigail Robertson, CBN News. Coming up, for some people, the time for Christmas observances seems to be starting sooner every year. Putting up Christmas lights, getting their trees ready. We'll take a look at how early Christmas is becoming more common and why it just may be a good thing. That's when we come back. If it feels like Christmas observances have come earlier again this year, you're not alone. You may even have noticed some of your neighbors putting up their Christmas trees and lights well before Thanksgiving. Apparently, early Christmas is a thing. And as Wendy Griffith reports, it may be just what we need. It's the holiday season everywhere. Let's face it, the last couple years have been tough. From COVID-19 to no high school graduations or proms to plain old cabin fever, it's no wonder many can't wait to usher in the Yuletide joy a little sooner this year. 
For hairdresser Alexis Bailey, that meant putting up her decorations in not one, but four trees two weeks earlier than normal. This is the one that I added last year. To me, Christmas is the best time of year. And so I'm like, let's just go ahead and bring it in. You know, let's decorate, let's get the thing, let's get things moving, let's get the holiday spirit going. And so for me, that's why I, I just wanted to do it early because I just felt like we needed that joy. Here at Granny's Christmas Tree Lot in Virginia Beach, the phone started ringing before Halloween. People wondering when they could come out and get their Christmas trees. Operator Scott Cust says business is way up from this time last year. Last year we opened up on the weekend before uh, Thanksgiving also, and we might have sold, I think, 22 trees, and we sold 73 trees yet on Saturday. This is definitely the earliest we've ever done it before. Mm -hmm. David and Ashley Lyons already have one tree up at home, but this year wanted to get a second tree for their two children to decorate. The one thing that COVID's kind of made you aware of is just the importance of family and just how much how fragile life is. I just thought, um, you know, a, a great way just for our own family to kind of develop some kind of Christmas cheer and just some excitement and just the coziness of all the decorations. Then I just put the wire underneath the ribbon. Bailey says whether it's making special bows to adorn the many gifts for her grandchildren or spending time with her family, the joy of Christmas is really all about the gift of Jesus. He is the reason for the season. I mean, that sounds cliche and people say that, but for me, it's that's for real. It's because I have the joy of the Lord that makes me want to decorate. And for those ready to tie a big bow on 2021, Christmas can't come soon enough. Wendy Griffith, CBN News, Virginia Beach. Wow, it is no wonder people are celebrating Christmas earlier. We have had a tough year. Well, that's it for this edition of CBN News Watch. Remember, you can find more of our news programs on CBN News Channel anytime or online with CBNNews.com. Also, you can tell us what you think about the stories you've seen by emailing newswatch at CBN.com or be sure to talk to us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Hope you'll join us next time. Have a great day and a great weekend.